Okay, hello. Um, my name is Emily Foster. I am a librarian at the Oakland History Center at the Oakland Public Library. Thank you guys for joining us tonight uh, for our program on food cooperatives of the San Francisco Bay Area, past, present, and future. Um, we're excited to have our guests here with us. Um, this program is part of our annual fall history series. So this is the second of six programs that we have lined up all in October. Um, so I'm just going to quickly tell you what the upcoming ones are. And I'm going to put a link in the chat here so you can get more info about them. But um, on this Saturday, uh, we have an in-person event here at the main library. It's um, Lois Ann Flood presenting on Isadora Duncan. So she'll be giving a talk and doing a dance performance about the famous dancer Isadora Duncan, October 15th. Um, next Wednesday, October 19th, there's a program about 50th anniversary of BART with um, Robert Powers and Michael Healy, who Robert Powers is general manager of BART, and Michael Healy is a longtime BART employee who's now retired, who wrote a history of BART. Um, on October 26th, we have a program called Visions of Black Futurity with Babette Thomas, who's a podcaster and historic researcher, um, who most recently did a podcast focusing on an artist um, named E.J. Montgomery, who is an Oakland artist. Um, and then on October 30th, uh, we have another in-person event, which is a haunted history bike ride, which will um, take everyone around to uh, historical haunted locations in Oakland. So um, yeah, please join us for the other events in the series. And um, yeah, we'll get started with this event now. So we have our moderator here, Shanta Nimbark Sakharov, who is the author of this book, Other Avenues Are Possible, about uh, the history of food cooperatives in the San Francisco Bay Area. So I'm going to hand it over to Shanta to introduce the other panelists, and I'm just going to share my PowerPoint screen here, and then we will um, get started. Okay, hello. Welcome. Happy Co-op Month. October is coined as a Co-op Month by the Co-op community to acknowledge Co-op contribution to the society socially and economically. And it's also we are celebrating educating the public that co-ops are different from corporation by definition. Cooperatives are set up to um, help the members to benefit the members and the community, whereas corporations are there to benefit the owner or owners and the shareholders. So that's a big difference. So thank you for including us in our, your History Month library. Um, as a moderator, I will speak some outlining the past of the San Francisco Bay Area's food cooperative that I had been proud of for a long, long time. Uh, but I will keep this part rather short so that the other people, the other panelists could talk about the current and the future food cooperatives of San Francisco Bay Area. So first we will have me talking a little bit about the past, then we will have Celia from Other Avenues, Food Co-op from San Francisco, then we will have Sue from Arismandi, Bakery Co-op, also from San Francisco. And then we will have Paula from Cultivate Community. This would be the future cooperative. It's not open yet. And that is in Venicia uh, Vallejo area. And that is called Cultivate Community Food Co-op. And lastly, we will hear from Jamila, who will talk about the deep grocery co-op that they hope to open in East Oakland. Now, historically, co-op have, 
co-ops have emerged and flourished in waves. Like they, for example, came during the depression era where self-help kind of organization cooperatives uh, open up food co-ops to bring food on the table because the economy had completely collapsed and they devised a system where they would barter food for services. So this was a creative solutions that co-op came up with to meet their dire needs. By contrast, the 60s and 70s food cooperatives that I have been part of didn't come just for economic needs, although we all wanted healthy food at reasonable price, but rather the focus was, or our intention was, to change the whole system. We wanted to change the system. We wanted to know why and how the food system had gotten corrupted and dysfunctional. And then we wanted to learn how to fix it with big and small steps. And we wanted to do this with a democratic way, with egalitarian way, with democratic governance. So the new way food cooperatives, as we called ourselves, the idea started in the 60s, but they actually established more like in the late 70s. Because when I arrived in San Francisco in early 70s, 71, there were no food co-ops in San Francisco. There were no Whole Foods. There were no TJs, no Amazon. There was awareness and interest in natural food, but there was no retail outlet for them. There were some mom and pop stores. A lot of them were ethnic stores that carried bulk food, carry healthy food, but that was all. But there was a big hub at the Almany Food Market, which was open only during the weekend. We all met there. The foodies of San Francisco Bay Area found their ways to go to the Almany market and we exchanged our ideas, we exchanged recipes, we exchanged information and so on. And this is where we actually found some important information about how to start a food buying club. So we started this food buying clubs called Food Conspiracies. You know, in the 60s and 70s, everything was conspiratorial. <laughs> so the food conspiracy groups came during the time when there were no food stores. And what we did is a few households will get together, like-minded people, they'll order food in the middle of the week, and then we will pick a food. The food will be picked up by a small group of people from the farmer's market, and then we will divide it in somebody's garage. So these food buying clubs really got a momentum where we not only distributed food, but we distributed ideas. We formed other groups, we joined rallies, we started childcare center, and we started many, many things. So it was a, more like a street-based, grassroots community movement that we started. The food conspiracies got so big and so cumbersome in San Francisco Bay Area that at one point there were over 100 food conspiracy group in the Bay Area. And this got a little bit out of hand. So we decided to open up stores in San Francisco Bay Area. Okay, now with nickel and dimes of garage sales and bake sales, we opened up two stores in 1973. Imagine that right now, you can't open up anything unless you have a million dollars and a huge marketing program, right? And so anyways, it was possible then because the real estate wasn't so bad and the labor was cheap and that was us, right? So out of the two stores that were very successful, we opened other stores and more stores and also other venues. There were wholesale outlets that supplied us with goods, anything from spices and grains and so on. So pretty soon, like within five years, we had a dozen storefronts between San Francisco, Oakland, and Berkeley. And we had about that many 
wholesale outlet that supplied us with goods. The idea was still the same as the food conspiracy. We were sharing foods, we were sharing ideas. This wasn't about making profit or even creating jobs. So this is something that we call food for people, not for profit. That was our mantra. And we called ourselves the people's food system. So the people's food system and the stores got very popular, got very big, and we served many people, thousands of households, and the momentum and the new wave lasted for several years. And the way we were different in the new wave, as opposed to the old wave food co-ops that were prior, is that our emphasis wasn't on growth. That was the emphasis for the old waves. Our emphasis was on changing the system and also in making sure that we did this without bosses, without manager, that we wanted to learn how to govern ourselves. Okay. Um, so the first five slides, if you can change it, they will show you the growth as well as a lot of the influences that the other organization that given to the food system. The time was right because we were along with other progressive movements that helped us. However, this movement or the people's food system didn't last very long. After several years, it flamed out. And it was very sad because it was built in very few years, very fast, but it flamed out even faster, like within a few months. Now, the story of how that happened, the growth as well as collapse, is a long story, probably worth having another panel discussion. But right now, what we are going to say, or I'm going to kind of conclude, is that the times had changed. The 60s and 70s were different from the 80s. The 80s were not co-op friendly years and the regnomics could care less about small businesses, let alone cooperatives. So one by one, the store closed and so did the wholesale venues. And what remained now, and some of the store actually did last until the 90s. What remains now are two stores. One is in the Mission District of San Francisco called the Rainbow Grocery Co-op, and the other is in the Sunset District of San Francisco called Other Avenues, and they're both doing great. There is another wholesale outlet that's still doing good and going big, and that's called Vegetable Vegetables, and that particular venue is no longer a co-op, okay? So if you want to know more about this moment, you can know about that from my book, Other Avenues Are Possible. And that book is available through bookstores as well as public libraries. So you don't have to go to Amazon, okay? <laughs> Thank you. Now I'm going to turn the platform to Celia. Celia from Other Avenues. Um, sorry, just a second. My screen sharing, I think, is not working properly. So let me troubleshoot for a second so that people can see the slides. All right. Um, just a second. I'm going to try. But you could hear me OK? Yes, we could hear you. But I don't think people saw the beautiful pictures. Um, so just a moment. Oh, there's Jonah. <laughs> can people see this rainbow grocery slide now? Yes. yes. Okay, let me go back so people can see the pictures that we missed. Cool. Uh, sorry about that. It was. Okay, so everyone saw this for a while, but then. This Chavez himself marching. And that's the warehouse. Some of these people are still shopping at other avenues. <laughs> That's rainbow. Okay, and then now you can pass it over. And that's uh, the year when I retired. 
from other avenues. Okay, Celia. Great. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Celia Labono Gonzalez. Um, pardon my intransitness. I hope the connection stays strong. Um, yeah, so I'm a worker owner of Other Avenues Grocery Cooperative. We were founded in 1974. Uh, we're a worker owned cooperative grocery store born out, born out of the San Francisco Food Conspiracy Network that later became the People's Food System. We cultivate a truly democratic business that empowers workers to steward their livelihoods. And we're committed to serving the community by offering accessible, nourishing, and regenerative natural products that support the health of the people and planet for present and future generations. So we do our best to offer both staples for your daily cooking needs, as well as specialty items sourced from local independent vendors. We offer 100% organic produce sourcing seasonally from local farms. Um, we aim to source regenerative organic and fair trade, as well as upcycled foods as much as possible. And we favor glass and compostable packaging. Uh, we do our best to meet a diverse set of grocery needs, both for cuisine wise and also diet specific. And we're always welcoming uh, product suggestions and all kinds of customer feedback. We really um, rely on that and really appreciate people telling us what they need. As, after all, it's a community grocery store. So we emphasize local, independent, and family-owned brands, and we highlight products from indigenous and black-owned businesses. We also strive to discontinue and replace certain familiar brands that have sold out to larger parent companies that don't align with our values or the regenerative organic agriculture movement, agroecology. And we're making this transition while being mindful of product quality and affordability, which is, again, important food access. So we're solar powered and we're proud to have received uh, the legacy business status in 2018 for historic small businesses that have operated in San Francisco for over 40 years. And we don't actually have much food waste as a lot of our cold um, produce and food items are either taken home by workers or we sell them through what we call our $5 second best produce bags. Um, and otherwise we donate a lot of stuff to food recovery or other volunteer organizations um, or are just appreciated by the neighborhood community at the end of the day. Um, so we currently have 18 worker owners that all share the responsibilities of running the business that's open every day, 8 a.m. to 9 p.m. Uh, we only fully close on May 1st and Martin Luther King Day. And so this, this kind of work includes everything from sharing shift work, so things like cashiering, customer service, free stocking, you know, fast movers, and just being on the retail floor. Uh, it also includes everyone um, having buying roles to order stock and be responsible for various departments that you see on the retail floor. Um, and also it includes like administrative work, so having roles in accounting, promo, personnel, payroll, and all kinds of maintenance tasks that we share. So we meet twice a month. Uh, we share a worker meal. Shanta often brings some food in and we really appreciate it. So delicious. So we meet twice a month as a board and we make collective decisions. We discuss proposals that anyone can bring forward and we use a consensus model. So a super consensus model where uh, we all have to agree to move forward with a proposal and even one person if they're not happy with it is able to block it so it really forces us to come together and discuss things and make really good business decisions um, and just community decisions as well workers um, and we also serve on different committees we have several we have you know a diversity equity and inclusion committee an ecology committee finance maintenance safety um, refrigeration, front of store improvements, it goes on. And also ad hoc committees that come up for special projects. Um, yeah, so we pay ourselves by the hour. So we're working about a minimum of 30 hours a week on average. And we also share the profit at the end of the year. So after we invest back into the business, um, whatever net profit there is, um, is split up among workers based uh, on hours worked. And so, although this compensation, you know, depends on our income generated by the business, um, you know, just to give like a ballpark of ideas, this could be around 45 or 65 K a year before taxes, um, which is pretty great for the industry. And, you know, a lot of people raise their families and um, 
you know, we work, we work to make the situation better as we can. Um, and we offer fully covered medical vision, dental coverage. We also, you know, have some other cool uh, supplemental wellness and uh, budgets. And we have renters and life and long-term disability insurance is applicable. So there's some pretty good benefits that come along with it. Um, and yeah, we get like four, four weeks paid time off a year and we're able to take up to six weeks off in a year. Um, and yeah, there's a small buy-in due at the end of six month applicant evaluation period that's paid in over the course of a year. It's not too noticeable. And, and we, we also to, you know, EUs and we make donations annually to local organizations. We began paying the Unican land tax to the association of Ramakrishna Loni, um, which we encourage everyone to do. And in the East Bay, there's another one I uh, like to donate to all kinds of local causes and direct action. Um, I was asked to kind of talk about some of the hurdles and rewards and, you know, in a short, and I'm happy to expand um, further in Q&A, but I think some of the hurdles, um, you know, just combating corporate control and consolidation in the food industry while also offering affordability and food access is a big hurdle and also very near and dear to my heart um, in terms of food systems and organizing for food sovereignty. But at the same time, some of the rewards are, you know, feeling empowered to facilitate change in the workplace and food industry and having design decisions and um, connection with the community and being able to educate and share what we're learning on the street um, and yeah, overall being connected. So um, hurdle and a reward kind of in one. In one. Yeah, um, thank you. I'm happy to answer any more questions at the end. Hey, so it's uh, now Sue from Arismandi who will be talking about the uh, Arismandi grocery, uh, Arismandi bakery. Great. Cool. Thank you, Shanta, and thank you, Emily. Um, hi, I'm, I'm Sue Lopez, and I am a worker owner and one of the founding members of Arizmendi 9th Avenue in San Francisco, which actually turns 22 years old tomorrow, our bakery is 22 years old. And this group, of the I've got quite a few photos that Emily's going to help us share. The photo that you're looking at um, is a group of about 22 people. Half of that group has been together for about 22 years. So that speaks very highly of our business model and what we've been able to do at the Arismendi Bakery, 9th Avenue. Um, I also worked with our Arismendi internal development team, the De Development Support Cooperative, also called the DSC, for four years between 2016 and 2020. To give you some history about the Arismendi Association of Cooperatives, we have to go back to 1967 when a young couple opened a cheese shop in Berkeley. And Emily, you can go ahead and forward the next few slides are just of my Ninth Avenue shop. And we have some of the workers, those, those are my coworkers. And then the next slide, so we have the cheese board. So in 1967, a young couple opened a cheese shop in Berkeley. Here's a, a nice shot of the front of the cheese board, obviously pre-pandemic. And um, after four years in 1971, after four years of running the place as bosses, they decided they elected to turn it into a worker owner cooperative, 100% worker owner cooperative. Um, the couple whose names were Elizabeth and Sahag actually became part of the cooperative as well and continued on with the cooperative. If you fast forward to the 1990s, the cheese board has become a stalwart of the community in Berkeley. And they continued to do their thing in their neighborhood, but they didn't want to go beyond their community. So in the mid nineties, we have a trio of people that you're looking at here, Tim Hewitt, Jack Caswan, and Steve Sucher at the bottom. Steve Sucher was a longtime cheese boarder who had been the cheese boards, cheese board since he was like in his early twenties and he just recently retired. And Jack Caswan in the top corner was a retired sociology professor that was very interested in the cooperative community. And the larger photo is of our, um, our lawyer, Tim Hewitt. So the three of them were part of a cooperative study group and they wanted to replicate cooperatives in the Bay Area. And they singled out the cheese board as a very 
successful cooperative, which is also highlighted in Shanta's book as a, a business that was started in the 60s and then was able to go with the flow and continue um, doing very good work through the decades. So in 1990, probably about 1994, the three of them approached the Cheese Board, which is then their fourth decade, and asked them if they would be interested in helping support the idea of replicating their business model. So other bakery cooperatives within the Bay Area. This is what I like to call the golden moment and the golden ticket, because the Cheese Board not only said yes to supporting the cause, with financial support, they also agreed to train the founding group of the first development of Arizmendi, share all the recipes, their systems, and their business know-how. They offer up everything but their name, which is why we have one cheese board and five Arizmendis right now. Um, and a brief FYI about the word, the name Arizmendi and where that came from. Arizmendi is a shortened name of Jose Maria Arizmendi Arieta, who was a young priest inspired he's a, go ahead the next slide i think we have a very fashionable shot of <laughs> father jose on his bicycle um he um young priest who inspired and helped found the mondragon cooperatives if you're interested in looking them up it's very interesting the largest group of cooperatives on the planet in the basque country of spain which was started to to help economic development after the spanish civil war in the middle of the century um so in 1986, with the Cheese Board support in place, we were able to start the Development Support Cooperative because they had decided, the three of them and other folks they were working with, that in order to have a thriving, um, a thriving group of cooperatives, you actually need to start a support cooperative first. So the DSC was started first, then the DSC would help the businesses go. And the DSC helps with legal assistance, finance support, finding the real estate cooperative systems, facilitation, mediation group process. They're kind of our go-to internal support program. So by 1997, with the Cheese Board support and a lot of family and friend finance support, we opened Arizmendi Lakeshore, um, which you're seeing right here, Arizmendi, if you do the math, they just turned 25 years old in August, which is an exceptional, um, milestone for them as well. And they have as well become an extremely successful um, business, much like the Cheese Board, focusing on their immediate community within the bakery and outside the bakery in Oakland. Uh, on the heels of the success of Lakeshore, we were able to open the bakery that I am a founding member of, um, Arizmendi Bakery 9th Avenue in San Francisco by Golden Gate Park, followed by three years later, uh, Arizmendi Emeryville in Sam, on San Pablo in Emeryville. Um, after that time with the growing tech industry and kind of the, there was a game changing for a lot of small businesses. We kind of took a, we hit the pause button on business development. And we just decided to focus on these three new heirs, Mendes. And not until 2010, when a local bank extended two small business loans, were we able to open two more heirs, Mendes, one in San Rafael, and one in the Mission District of San Francisco, which is commonly known as Arizmendi Valencia. There we have a really nice shot of the workers in the, in the inside of their shot. Um, that, that, is the, uh, that was the last Arizmendi. We also branched out a little bit. We have a landscape design cooperative called Root Volume. We don't have any images of their, their work, but they are called Root Volume. And we did try our hand at also branching out into construction, Arizmendi construction. Um, we gave that a shot for about six years. And unfortunately, we're, we're closing that cooperative. Uh, but we figure out of about seven businesses, one experiment that didn't go well, it was still a wonderful experience. And we're happy that we gave that a shot. So how does this all work democratically? We are all committed to our goal to run successful democratic businesses or democratic demonstration projects, as Tim likes to say. We have a policy council in which there's equal representation per co-op that sit on a board that makes decisions that affect all of us, as well as help direct the support that our internal support team does. Within each business, there are regular business meetings and that strive to build consensus whenever possible, similarly to what Celia was talking about. And workers are member owners of their own individual business and hourly wages are based on the financial success of each individual business, as well as the profit sharing system that is distributed equally by based on the number of hours. Similarly, again, like Celia was speaking of, 
um, vacation policies, health cares, and benefit vary per business, but we frequently check in with each other to make sure that um, everything's working out for everybody and we're all here to support each other. How does this work within the food industry business? Food industry, um, when I talk with non-cooperative people about my job and that I'm a baker in a cooperative, they normally ask like, well, who's in charge and there must be a boss who must take turns being a manager because the concept of running a non-hierarchical business, especially in the food industry, is um, kind of foreign to most people. And the Ares Money model is based on equal pay per within each business, depending on the viability of the business. So whether or not I've been at my business for 22 years or we have a new hire that started like literally a month ago, we're making the exact same wage. And we find that to be an idealistic yet very pragmatically successful way to run a business because there's nothing more genuinely motivating to a worker than to realize that their direct actions and engagement with their job will affect their paycheck. So everyone has a vote and everyone has a voice. One person, one vote is the most important tenet of our cooperative business. Our worker cooperative community and workers' rights community is doing its best to help exemplify that there is indeed another way of doing business, not only running a cooperative that happens to be a business, but successfully running a financially viable and thriving business that happens to be cooperatively run. Mm -hmm. And we're very, I'm very proud to be part of that movement. Um, how does this work financially? All of our bakeries pay quarterly fees within the pot to help fund the support work that I was speaking about. The idea has successfully turned the idea of franchises on its head because the more support you need, the, the less support, the less fees you pay. And conversely, the businesses that are doing the best financially probably require less support services. So the, the, um, the higher fees that you're paying are actually going to support the other businesses within our support system, which are our, our cooperatives, sister businesses. And this generosity of spirit and dedication to democracy in the workplace has been inherent within the creation of the Ares Mindy Association. And this would not exist today without the initial support from the Cheese Board Collective in Berkeley. And this is a legacy of community and generosity that I hope will continue for many generations to come. Um, there might be a group, uh, there might be a photograph, Emily, of our, um, our retreat. We, pre-pandemic, we were trying to get together every few years as all of us. We're probably about a group of about 160 to 170 people. Wow. And probably would probably have about two thirds of them would show up for a one day retreat and we'd all get together and have a lot of fun and talk about a lot of business. Um, that probably is the last slide that I have to share, but thank you again for organizing and um, please continue reading about co-ops and learning about it and getting involved. Happy to move on now. Hey, thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Paula from Cultivate Community Food Co-op, Benicia Vallejo. Take on. Hi there. Hi, everybody. Um, so I, for some reason, I can't see the slides. So um, I, some pilot error on this end. So I will just um, kind of speak and I guess some slides will go after. I don't know what happened. But my name is Paula Schnazy. Um, I'm the founder of Cultivate Community Food Cooperative. Um, we are a consumer owned cooperative um, in the Benicia Vallejo area. We say that because we don't have a store yet and we're looking for property in both of those areas because we really want to support both of those communities. Um, so I've been uh, a few questions asked of me before. Uh, okay, so so who who we are? So we're Cultivate Community Food Cooperative, a startup a, a startup food co-op, a consumer owned. Our mission is to build a thriving, full service natural grocery store um, that's owned by the people, and to build it um, again in the Benicia Vallejo area. We are a California cooperative. Uh, corporation and we um, so we're a for-profit business and we were incorporated in July of uh, 2007. Um, so so I'm the founder of the co-op and why did I start it? I moved here in uh, 2014, 2013-14 and I was struck by the lack of choice in our community. 
we have two national chain grocery stores and I was surprised that that was it. Um, coming from shopping in Berkeley, uh, which I actually continue to do today until the store is open. Um, yeah, I was just put off by the lack of choice. And so after some thinking, um, just thought, okay, I can't complain if it hasn't been started before, um, you know, I should make do something about the food system. Um, you know, if not now, when? If not me, who? So I just I just jumped right in. Um, so also, I didn't know anybody in the community, so I really wanted to meet people. And um, yeah, so I so um, so that's how it got started. Um, I pulled some people together. We had a, a um, steering team. And then it took a year and a half for me to appoint our first board. So in that time, introducing it to our community and actually incorporating, um, it spent a lot of time you know, trying to, to, to meet people and get education. I went to a, a national conference, um, the Food Co-op Initiative. If anybody out there is interested in starting a food cooperative, um, they specialize in consumer-owned cooperatives and definitely give them a call because we, I, we could not do this without them. So the Food Co-op Initiative, um, so we've been getting a lot of great advice from them. And, and one of them was, take your time to find your board of directors. Uh, so again, it took me a year and a half and that, that paid off. So, um, uh, so once, once I started the co-op, then we, I got, you know, more and more reasons why this is so important for our area. Um, so for one, we want to control our food system. Um, recently, uh, a Raley's left Vallejo and so many times these big national grocery stores are leaving their areas because they're not just, they're just not pulling in, on, in enough profits. Um, and so they don't care about the community. So they up and leave. So that, that, that was huge. Having a food cooperative, it's owned by the community. It's not gonna up and leave. So that was, that was really important to us. Um, and then we're going to create markets for our food producers. So a lot of these fledgling uh, startup food businesses, they can't get into a grocery store. So they're, they're always at the farmer's markets and, you know, selling online. But we wanted to provide a market for these food producers. Um, and then we also want the food in our store to reflect all the cultural diversity in our community. Um, Vallejo is known for one of the most diverse uh, cities, and so we want that to uh, reflect in our stores. So in the grab and go area, we want to have foods from all different ethnicities. Uh, we also want to te teaching teach cooking classes and nutrition, um, and you know cater to all the different ethnic foods out there. Um, then as we, as we were going, we realizing that, um, um, that uh, Vallejo is a food desert. So we want to help our community with that as well. Um, then also we found out that our food dollars were leaving our area because if you want to uh, eat healthy in our community, you need to leave the bridges. There's two bridges on each side of Vallejo and Benicia. We're, we're sandwiched together. So uh, we want to keep our food dollars here. Um, Co-ops lead in sustainability. So we wanted to create a store to, to reflect that with the bulk buying, with the less miles traveled. Um, we want to build more of a community with all these different ethnic groups. Wouldn't it be great to have a place where everybody's welcome and, and just, just a thriving cultural center for our community? Um, so, and then the benefits of ownership, our benefits that were a little different. I mean, they're similar and yet different just because we are a consumer owned. So the owners, they do have input um, on how the store is run. Uh, they get to vote for the board of directors. 
Um, it's right now it's it's run by, by a board that is a governing board and a working board. Once the store opens, we will have a general manager and paid employees, and that and then the board will shift to more of a governing board. Um, and then of course, there's benefits for ownership. While well, anybody will be able to shop at the store, the um, the owners have benefits from their patronage to the store in the form of dividend checks. And then there's also gonna be owner discount days. So we thought all of these great things, and aside from the fact that food cooperatives are such a great business model and they just do wonderful things for the community. We really wanted to bring all of that to this community and really and really build up our community. So that's that was really important to have a food co-op as opposed to um, just another independent store. Um, when will we open and where will we open is the biggest questions we get asked. So um, startup food cooperatives, we have a timeline. And uh, in today's competitive food co-op market, we need owners before the store. So we're a little different from the 70s where they went smaller and got bigger and bigger and bigger. We need to start big right away. So we need 1,200 owners to have doors on our store. At this time, we have 509 owners. Um, so we, we have a ways to go. So when will we open? When the community really gets behind us, when we get to that tipping point and everybody wants to be a part of the co-op and knows that this is a great idea. Um, so, you know, so help us, you know, become an owners and just spread the word. If you have relatives that live in this area, spread the word that we're, we're that we're here. Um, so at this time, we are looking for locations. We are setting up different meetings. Next week, we have a meeting with the city of Vallejo to see how they can help us, see if that they have any sites that they might be able to recommend, see what kind of funding that they could have to support us. Um, and then once we have some, some serious sites, we'll do our, conduct our market study. We have our consultant already lined up and she'll do an analysis of a few properties. Um, then once we kind of define a property, then we'll have a feasibility study done. What will be feasible for our store in that area, in that location? Um, as far as personal rewards, I feel like I'm doing something. I'm, I'm pushing that boulder a little bit, you know, closer to, to uh, economic and food justice. So that's really important to me. Um, I'm fulfilling a, a passion of giving, I think everybody needs access to healthy foods. So that's really important to me. And this is a way to make that happen. Um, and then, you know, meeting some really cool people in our community and setting an example. When I started the co-op, I had teenagers in middle school and high school and just, you know, setting an example for them, knowing, you know, you know, set your dream and, and focus on your passions and do what you believe in. Um, as far as the challenges, um, it's a lot harder and longer than I anticipated. A um, lot, of, lot of time spent, um, a lot of time in the beginning, like before in, in, in corporation, um, I was doing a lot. Um, I'm still doing a lot, but we need to, and we're spreading, spreading the load. Um, and, um, you know, I would just, I would just say it's, it's a lot of work and there's some stress, there's some sleepless nights, um, there's time away from family activities. So, um, so I'm not loving that, but it's for a higher purpose and that there's, there's, um, there's satisfaction in that. Um, as far as the food co-op challenges with us right now, um, I'd say managing people to get things done. Uh, we're all volunteers. Um, and as Stuart said from the Food Co-op Initiative, he's the executive director there, volunteers can be very expensive. So that is a challenge. Um, so we need to get some funding to you know, maybe hire some more people to, to take us uh, to the distance a little faster. Um, changing, changing the board 
has been challenging. You get all kind of set in the board and you're working together and then people leave and then new people come in. Um, so we're, we've learned that we need to recreate our culture every time we have a new board um, and you know form it. Um, so we do a retreat in the beginning of new board members um, so that we are all um, on the same page working for good um, so that that's kind of a challenge. Um, and if we don't create our culture, our, our healthy culture, another culture will be formed <laughs> instead that might not be so healthy. So it's really important to, for us to focus on our culture. Um, and um, yeah, so I would say managing the people would be the biggest challenge. Um, so where are we now? So just in closing, I just want to, um, so we are celebrating our fifth annual meeting in a couple of weeks. Um, the annual meetings is our yearly event to bring our owners um, up to speed on what's happening, our bylaws. Um, uh, let's see, we are, oh, our elections are underway. We have three new board members coming on, so we'll be training our new board members. Recently, we hired, uh, we finally filled our position of volunteer coordinator. So that's going to be huge, having somebody dedicated to find the volunteers to do the different tasks that we need. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we're meeting with officials about, um, oh, and then also recently, we got approached for a um, notice of funding availability in our county. So our county got $3 million for emergency food funding. And so we are um, applying for that, so fingers crossed. Um, so that'll help us move forward with some, with some market and feasible, feasibility studies. Um, and then planning for next year. Next year, we'd like to do some food events each quarter to really engage our community. And um, so that's about it. We got, we got a, lot, a lot of work ahead of us. Um, we need a lot more owners and, uh, but it, it's moving forward. And yeah, I think again, I believe every community ought to have a food cooperative. Every person should be able to have access to healthy foods. And, and if you wanna start a food cooperative, reach out to the Food Co-op Initiative in Minnesota. So thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Emily, for hosting this um, at the Oakland Library. And thanks for being here, everybody. And go co-ops. Hey, next is Camila from the Deep Grocery Food Co-op. Greetings, everyone. Um, I'm Jamila Lane, co-founder, worker, owner of the Deep. The DEEP stands for Deep East Oakland Empowering the People, and we're based in East Oakland. We are a worker-owned grocery co-op dedicated to restoring East Oakland's community um, through organic produce, community education, and cooperative economics, prioritizing the well-being of Black and Brown people. Our work is proudly changing the narrative of food apartheid by bringing affordable, fair trade, organic produce and a sustainable economy to Deep East Oakland's residents. We are committed to creating spaces for learning and unapologetic black and brown joy that transforms our hood. We were officially launched um, September, 2020. Um, we started out with seven members and then down to four cohort members. And now just me being the only active member currently um, just a little background, so how the project came about. Um, in 2009, there was a community survey that was conducted, and the results showed that 33% of East Oakland residents responded that there is not a full-service, affordable supermarket near their house. Um, at this time, there were recorded nine supermarkets in Oakland Hills and only four in the flatlands of East Oakland. So folks would shop, you know, at their corporate supermarkets like um, Food Max, Safeway, um, to name a few. And the average traveling was about 20 minutes from their house, which is kind of far if you think about it. Um, historic patterns of uneven development and 
systematic marginalization in Oakland results that the flatlands of East Oakland resembles that Jacqueline Badaiko has defined it as food apartheid. Um, so it's in place of the USDA's term food desert. So East Oakland is more like food apartheid. It's not a desert. Um, in 2018, organic conversations around the co-op um, came about. And at the time, Aya Jeffers Fabro from Acton on Verba um, led our founding cohort team to start this project. And she was in charge of anchoring food systems with the East Oakland Neighborhoods Initiative. And finally, October of 2019, there was a community plan um, by Better Neighborhood Same Neighbors, um, which spoke about having new bike infrastructure, urban greening, and mobile medical services. So our team started with the intention to make this a reality. We wanted to be able to show folks that it's possible to open a worker-owned grocery store in a neighborhood where there is not one that exists. So the deeps, our vision is to operate the store full-time, um, emphasizing healthy and culturally recognizable foods and locally made goods. We want to support black and brown farmers and producers and create equitable job opportunities and a resilient economy provide members, residents, and local schools with holistic wellness and food education, and partner and collaborate with mission-aligned organizations to fight and end food apartheid. So for example, we've given out food to our community, distribute hot meals. Um, we've also partnered with an organization, which you see in the photo here, um, they're called CRC, Community Ready Corps, and they helped us with distributing foods throughout East Oakland for the last year. Um, so we've been giving out at least two to 500 bags a week to schools, recreation centers, senior homes, and in different, um, like here we're at Eastmont or in the neighborhood, we we're walking down the street giving out food. Um, so the time I joined, why did I join? Um, previously, I was an educator in the Oakland public school system, and I was working with a lot of youth, and most youth would come from recess, hungry, either high energized, or just eating a lot of junk food. Um, and the school that I taught at was Burkhalter, and I started a plant-based food club. So every week we will make, um, healthy meals and we broke down the meals, the nutrients in the meals and the students really love them. So at the time I heard about the project, I thought why not I should join. Um, also because I'm an entrepreneur, I have a, a juice business called Melonade. So I thought both of the missions to help feed my community were um, alike. So what have we done so far? Um, we've had an online grocery store to start out. Um, we started April 2021, and it didn't last very long. We ended it in June of 2021. Um, we've led many food demos at um, apartment complexes in East Oakland. Um, we started a fundraiser in 2020, and I have not been able to reset and change our link. It's been a little funky. Um, some personal rewards were the beginning of our cohort, which included team building, envisioning for this project, um, making it through candidacy and officially becoming an owner and also establishing our um, corporation, getting all the articles and bylaws completed. Um, having hands-on support from Mandela Food Cooperative, as well as CRC. Um, seeing the smiles and affirmations on the residents' faces uh, when we pass out food, and some challenges. Uh, we started our project in the middle of the pandemic. I know it sounds crazy. Uh, to me, I, I made a joke the other day and I was like, I feel like I've been in a pandemic my whole life. <laughs> but in some ways um, that was a real challenge because um, we didn't really have face-to-face -face meetings. We had to meet through Zoom. So you don't get that human interaction when you're building something like this. 
Um, but then so, I would say it's like 50 50 in some ways it was good because a lot of folks supported us starting out and we still get the same support. Um, sweat equity has been a challenge too because we haven't been able to fairly pay ourselves. And I know that's what comes with the work. So I've been just kind of winging it. Um, I don't want to do this work myself. So working solo for a year has been a challenge, just kind of keeping the dream alive. Um, looking for a location also has been another challenge. As Shanta mentioned, you, you don't get the same property prices nowadays costing millions of dollars to just rent something out and me not having experience. I've never bought a property, nothing like that. So that's been a challenge. Um, also running all the platforms. So like our social media, marketing, outreach, kind of keeping everything in order. That's been a challenge for me, um, but I do as much as I can when I can. And on the brighter side, um, we are looking to recruit new members. Um, so I hope to host some recruitment sessions during the winter and spring, or fall, winter, sorry, no, winter, spring. Um, so we want to build our team. We want to have folks that are interested in food justice, um, who want to help save and serve their community and who don't have job experience because it's a good way to work um, and become an owner if you're interested in owning a business. Um, and then another positive thing is that we've had connections with the Black Cultural Zone um, and EB Prec, so we're just uh, working on leveraging our partnerships. Um, and I really want to reach out to Ares Mindy because I enjoyed hearing Sue speaking about their governance and their franchises. And because that's what it's about, like supporting our respective businesses for them to grow. So I just have a lot of homework to do, but I'm ready and I'm happy to be here. And thank you all for listening. Okay, so this is the end of the panel. Now, if you have any questions, audience, this is your turn. Or well, if the panelists have questions of each other, this is your turn as well. Okay. No questions? Well, I'll, I'll ask a question. Okay. Um, yeah, I was just wondering, Jamila, like how can, can people support you in um, getting deep off the ground and into a building? Um, how can the Oakland community, um, yeah, support you? or the Bay Area community in general? Right. Oh, that's a really great question. Um, I've been thinking about how to host these recruitment sessions because I know part of it is having folks that are like dedicated and, and want to see the work. And I know it could be a challenge to start something from the ground up, um, especially if you don't know like the future of it or was to come. So um, things that I've been thinking about are getting an advisory board or even folks. So right now we're not doing any kind of distributions at the moment, but I know that we could benefit from, you know, really getting our governance strong. Um, also maybe holding spaces like maybe um, listening sessions where folks can um, speak and just craft ideas of locations. I think locations is a really mm -hmm. big one. So if you know anybody knows how to get in, um, you know a space or find a space, um, that would be really great. Um, 
Yeah. Okay, thank you, Jamila. Um, I just have a comment and I just want to thank um, Oakland Library to give us a podium. But I also wanted to say that when people ask me, like whatever happened to the people's food system, you know, uh, how come it just disappeared? And I say, no, it didn't disappear. It just morphed into other things. So here are some of the examples. And I'm not saying that this wouldn't have happened without the people's food system, but I think that we all evolved from what was happening before us. And just like the people's food system gained a lot of the knowledge and expertise and tools from other moments, and uh, we are also current food co-ops are learning from the young generation. Hopefully young generation will pick up and start new co-ops. So I have a lot of hope for the future cooperatives. And thank you, Emily. Looks like Peter has a question. Peter, you can go ahead and unmute yourself. Yeah, I, I thank you everybody. This was really interesting to hear. And I'm just curious, maybe Shanta, this is a question for you or, or anyone really, but so I live in Oakland and I, you know, I, I shop at Mandela and to my knowledge, that's the only food co-op in Oakland. And I'm also not aware of any in Berkeley and it, it's always just kind of surprised me. And I'm wondering, if maybe there's a historical perspective on why there aren't any, um, you know, in, you know, basically in the East Bay, I, I'm sure I'm missing something, but there are at least there aren't very many prominent co-ops other than Mandela, which, which is great, but it, it just, I guess, especially in Berkeley, it surprises me that there aren't any there. So I'm wondering about that. Yeah, I, I'd like to try to answer and Peter, I am myself also really puzzled by Berkeley not having a co-op because when I came to San Francisco Bay in the early 70s, we didn't have any food co-op in San Francisco, but there was actually a really good food co-op, consumer food co-op in uh, Berkeley. And, you know, it folded a few years later, but it was really good. That's where I actually learned how to read labels. So they had some educational program. It was a great co-op, you know, when though it was consumer co-op. Um, I Berkeley seems really strange compared to 60s and 70s. Like I want to shake it up. Like nothing is happening. It's kind of sleepy town, you know, except for the university. And I have no idea what universities are doing. University has a housing co-op that's really good, you know, but it's part of the university. There was a small co-op that the students started, but it was really, really teeny. And I don't know if it really served anybody. So I'm puzzled. Uh, I believe that it's mostly because of uh, the real estate being difficult, but I also think that a lot of the um, need for the healthy food was co-opted by Whole Foods and TJs and whatnots. What is really good, which I again say the legacy of whatever happened before is a lot of um, markets, farmers markets. So that would be your other option, Peter, at least for fresh produce. Yeah, and I'll just Thank chime you. in that um, the Bay Area Worker Cooperative has a great map um, that maps um, all the worker-owned co-ops in the Bay Area, as far as Santa Rosa to Santa Cruz. Um, and there is the Berkeley Student Food Co-op. It is really, really tiny, but it does exist. And it's do, it's uh, currently closed. Very much. Um, I'd also like to add, so yeah, when I moved to Berkeley in uh, 92, uh, the Berkeley the uh, co-op, it was huge. It had just closed. It closed in 89. So the big, huge uh, cooperative that Shanta's talking about was started after the Great Depression. And um, then it closed in 89. And they actually had the wherewithal to write a book about why it closed. 
And I, I got it. I, I have that book. I got it at one of the conferences. But every chapter is a little bit about why they think it closed. And it's it's really great. It, all different people's perspective. Um, but I would kind of think that um, there's some really great independent grocers in Berkeley. And so, you know, you get the Monterey Market. And then from the Monterey Market, you got the Berkeley Bowl and then the Berkeley Bowl, too. So, I mean, I think food cooperatives were really started to bring the local healthy foods, but I think some of those consumer, or some of those independent grocers, they get it and they have that product in their store. They have, at least they have the choice. They have conventional and the healthy. Um, but now, now we're seeing more like the, the co-op month, the, the theme is economic justice or something like that, food justice. And cooperatives are now more getting involved with that is what I've is what I'm understanding. Now that some of the other grocery stores are carrying the healthy foods, we're with, you know, just a, a good place to work and taking care of our employees. And like this all blo ballooned up from the pandemic of all these grocery stores you know, um, not treating their employees well. So I think co-ops now have another another focus, but that would, that's what I would say why there's not that many in Berkeley. Good, good response. Anything else, anybody? Thank you, Peter. Thanks, everybody. Yeah, thank you all for coming. Um, I guess we'll wrap it up. Oh, wait, uh, Jonah, do you have a hand up or you're just? No, no. okay. Um, <laughs> um, okay, we'll wrap it up. Thank you all for coming. Um, I hope to see some of you at some of our upcoming events. And yeah, have a good night. Okay.